paper. Okay. And now we're going to let them in. Okay. Participants, where are you? Here you are. Admit all. Here we go. Now they're all joining. Two more people. I just want to say thank you so much for doing this. <laughs> no problem. I'm going to mute everybody so we don't have any. Yeah, no, I'm going to I'm going to mute myself again. I just want to. And then we, we're going to open it up to questions afterwards. Okay. Okay. So we'll just give it one more minute and then uh, we'll start uh, the main event. All right, so it's a little bit after one o'clock. Um, so I'm Dr. Rogu from RBK Pediatrics. And um, what we learned through this COVID uh, pandemic is we have to keep in touch with our patient and share our medical knowledge and experience with our patients when we may not be able to reach them physically. So we came up with this idea of doing these little Zoom meetings and then put them on Facebook and ultimately putting them on our website with various topics that um, people are interested in. So Dr. Riley is going to speak to you today about COVID-19 and how you are susceptible to a viral infection and do not even know about it. So Dr. Riley is one of our senior physicians at RBK. He's been with us since 1998, I think, if I can remember that far back. Yes, I um, um, trained at Jacoby Medical Center, Montefiore Medical Center, and he's been with us at RBK ever since. So Dr. Riley, if you want to start. Uh, Thanks, George, right? So I wanna actually, before I start anything, I just wanna thank Dr. Goku because to tell you the truth, he's like the technical wizard. He makes all this kind of stuff work. And uh, I'm, I'm more interested in some of these kind of nutrition kind of things. Um, as you can see from my cover screen, I'm uh, also a pediatrician, but I also am board certified in obesity medicine and clinical lipidology. And because of this, I think I have a little bit of a unique perspective on the COVID-19. And, and today I'm gonna to share a lot of stuff with you and, and I'm gonna to try to make it understandable for everybody, but it, it, it is gonna be something that, uh, it's gonna be a lot of uh, nutrition kind of information. So um, Dr. Rugu is gonna be working the slide. So if you can give me the next slide, sir. So yeah, so it's for informational purposes and uh, Usually, if you want to know anything specifically for yourself, then we might have to talk to you. But with this slide, I just I wanted to talk about this, is that um, when they look at people in the United States and you hear these kind of reports on the news, um, that what, one of the things that kind of bothers me a little bit is that they talk about how um, sometimes people will be sick and they'll say, oh, that person was a, a healthy kind of person. and and we don't understand how they got sick. And in reality, only of adults, really only one out of every eight adults is actually considered to be metabolically healthy if I actually were to look at their bloods. So the overwhelming majority of adults are actually not healthy. And almost all of it is related to their food. And some of the stuff that we're gonna talk about today is gonna to be just to, to teach you guys a little bit about this kind of thing. So I can get the next slide. So yeah, so this is actually one of the things that, that we see is that healthy people um, are kind of like the regular people. And unfortunately, um, we see that it's actually a, a confluence of some of these kind of factors where people are leading uh, sedentary lives, where they're eating processed food and perhaps watching a little bit too much 
Netflix and drinking sodas and juices. And we know all these things are actually not good for our health. And normally, it's not a big deal un unless you're being exposed to something like the SARS-CoV-2, which is the virus that causes COVID-19. Um, can I get the next slide? So I, I tell people all the time that our immune system is a counter-punching immune system. And what this means is that how our immune system works is a virus tries to go into our body and through a complex mechanism, we're able to produce antibodies um, to kind of fight this off. But to have all this work, we have to have all the building blocks for a healthy immune system. And, and if you go to the right-hand side and you're eating those kind of foods, then you get all those building blocks. If you go to the left-hand side, you actually are not going to be having all those building blocks. Next slide. So this is where I, I do my mea culpa, right? Because when I, when I did join in the 90s, um, I didn't really, uh, I think, know as much about nutrition as I do now. And I think that it's partly the doctor's fault, right? And I blame the guys in medical school, right? Because they never taught me anything like this. I had to teach myself about all this kind of stuff. And, and a lot of this started when, um, like my wife had breast cancer and I had to teach a lot, of, a lot of this kind of stuff to myself. But you can see on this slide, in, back in the day, this was the food that they, kids would be eating. Liver soup and egg yolks and beef. And these, those guys were smart in those days. These are the foods that actually have the most nutrition. And then I put a picture here of the graduates yogurt melts, which is candy right? And yet we're giving it to kids as if it was food. And unfortunately, when they eat candy instead of food, they're not actually getting the nutrition. And the kids and the adults all run the risk of becoming what I call dilute, where the kids are growing bigger, but they're actually not having enough, enough of the nutrients inside of themselves. Can I get the next slide? So this is, um, this slide, you can read it, but it basically what it says is that, um, what we feel like is happening is that people are becoming deficient in a lot of the micronutrients. And our body is smart, right? It knows which are the micronutrients that we need to live day to day, and which are the ones that if we're a little bit low in today, we can kind of put it on the back burner and hope that your body is gonna actually get these nutrition, you get these micronutrients in the future. Unfortunately, what it usually tends to put on the back burner is your immune system which is normally fine until you get sick, right? And this is one of the reasons why we feel like guys are getting extra sick. Next slide. So is this really a thing, Dr. Riley, that uh, people are having micronutrient deficiencies? So this is from the CDC website, and it shows the prevalence of vitamin deficiencies. And you can see that it's a lot of us, right? And even this data is probably an, an underestimate because this is kind of what they're saying is like the bare minimum. But like I said to you that your body is smart. So if you're sick, you might need, for example, more of the vitamin C. And if you're living like on the edge, then you're in big trouble. So like when you're sick, it's kind of like when you take a test, right? If you're getting a 66, yeah, you pass the test. So technically you don't pop up in this graph. But it's not like you knew the subject very well and you were at your, your maximum health. So this is actually one of the things that, that I worry about because as I look at the data, I think it's the people who are in this kind of deficient or near deficient range, they're the ones who actually, quite frankly, end up coming to see me for consults and things like that. So I can get the next slide. So, so this is the deal with COVID-19, right? This is a very new disease. So uh, I'm gonna have some data, but because it's so new, it's hard to have like really strong data, the result of randomized controlled trials. So what we're gonna do here is we're gonna show you in the next few slides, what is like our best guess? What are the things that we can find in foods? Because I'm a big believer that I think most of the things that we should get, we should be getting from foods. Um, this is our best guess how someone can keep themselves healthy. And the first thing I'm going to talk about is vitamin D, because I think that actually I have the most data and it's the most important. And I'll be on the next slide. 
So vitamin D, I, you know, I probably don't have to tell people that there's a huge number of people who have low vitamin D. And, and part of it, it's, it's becoming our culture to be more inside. So even if you live in an area of the world which is fairly sunny, um, even those guys are having low vitamin D. Um, one of the things that's happening is all this, all this kind of uh, COVID-19 stuff means that every day there's new data. And since I gave this to Dr. Ogu, there's actually new data where they were looking at the vitamin D levels in Europe and they actually see that the vitamin D levels in the Northern countries are actually better than in Italy and in France, which it didn't make sense to me because I was thinking that those places are more sunny. They should actually have better vitamin D levels. But because the more Northern countries know vitamin D is a problem, they're more likely to supplement. So it actually, like Italy, for example, has one of the worst vitamin D levels in all of Europe, which kind of makes sense. Why are they having such big problems, right? Um, vitamin D we know is actually important uh, for influenza. So this is actually not controversial. So when they look at people, when they have vitamin uh, D deficiency and they get influenza A, they get worse. They, are, they actually um, get much sicker and they have actually done studies where they give to children uh, vitamin D supplements and they look to see what happened to them when they got uh, influenza A and they saw that 20% of the kids um, when they were not supplemented got symptomatic from their from their influenza A, and only 10% got symptomatic when they were supplemented with vitamin D. Now, part of the deal with vitamin D is that you get much more bang for your buck if you're low in vitamin D. So usually part of it is like we used to say, know your number for cholesterol. I would say for vitamin D, know your number. Because if you're low in vitamin D, it seems like your innate immunity is less and you're more likely to get yourself into trouble, right? So I'm gonna show you in the next slide, this is a study that was just done recently from the guys from Northwestern. And basically what it says, I put a lot of stuff here to read because I figured like in the future people will be able to look at it online. Basically it says, if you had lower vitamin D, this is looking at all the available data that was available online, they went through every country. The lower your vitamin D, the worse you were. So if you had, um, less than 20 your vitamin D, you had much more problems. If you had normal vitamin D, it seems like you are gonna be doing better. Now, vitamin D is a confounder because the older you are, the less likely you are to make vitamin D. But for example, like when they looked at people who were sick in Italy, some of the sickest people, they had vitamin D levels of five, which um, just so you know, a normal vitamin D is considered to be 30. So if you have one sixth the normal amount of vitamin D, you're in big trouble. And, in, and that's probably true of almost any kind of vitamin you have in your body. If you have one sixth the level, you are in big trouble. And unfortunately, people have low the vitamin D and they are, they are gonna be in big trouble. Now, normally that's part of our, our routine in RBK is once you get a certain age, we do a, a full workup and part of our full workup is vitamin D. And uh, it is a thing that we actually are probably one of the few people that are actually really good about this. Can I get the next slide? So yeah, so this is, uh, this just came out like a week ago, right? And this is an incredibly scary kind of slide. So I'm just gonna talk you through it. So you see the green bars and the blue bars. So what, what am I showing, right? So this is uh, from Indonesia. And this is actually a lot of different countries, they have similar slides, but this one is actually, is kind of nice. So they looked at people when they were in the ICU, who were the people that were able to get out of the ICU and who were the people who didn't get out of the ICU. And you could see that if you had a vitamin D level that was less than 20 and you were in the ICU, you did not leave there walking out, right? That you were in big trouble. If you had a level between 20 and 30, you see that only a small number of those guys actually survived, that most of them did not make it. Whereas if you ended up in the ICU and you were actually um, had over a 30, almost all of them did fine, right? So this is, this is for me incredibly scary because 
when I was a young doctor, right, when I joined Dr. Rogu for the first time here in, in RPK, um, the average or the normal level was considered to be 20. So we didn't actually do anything if someone had a 22 uh, vitamin D because we thought that was fine. But apparently it makes the difference, literally makes the difference between life and death. So it is a thing that when you see graphs like this, it, it is kind of very scary for me because there's a lot of people going out there that I send them for vitamin D levels and they don't go, right? But I would say, I would want everybody to make sure that their level is good. Next slide. So now the only thing with vitamin D is that there you will, if you kind of search on the internet, you'll see that some guys will say, look, don't go so crazy with the vitamin D. And this is, and I'm gonna present their point of view, is that there's a lot of reasons why someone will have low vitamin D. And like I said, a confounder is, when you're an older person, the older you are, the harder it is for your body to make vitamin D. So of course, the lower your vitamin D, the more likely you are to not make it when you get the COVID because most of the COVID fatalities are usually happening in people in their 80s, right? But I would counter that by saying, look, you know, it, it is a thing that, for example, like what I was saying is that why are the people in the North doing better than the people in the South? And, and their correlation is that, you know, one of the correlations is that they have low vitamin D, but there, there are definitely other reasons why someone will have low vitamin D. And, and one of them is that they have a certain genetic predisposition to having low vitamin D, or they might be one of these people, they don't like to go out in the sun, right? And certainly maybe unhealthy people, they are less likely to go out in the sun. Maybe you have a poor diet. One of the things that we do see is that people who eat a lot of processed foods, they are more likely to have low vitamin D because there's something about the processed foods that actually really like eats the vitamin D. And perhaps unhealthy people are less likely to be ones who take vitamins. And maybe that's what we're seeing, that uh, these are people who are less likely to take vitamins, right? And maybe healthy people are more likely to be outdoorsy, eating fish um, and you know, doing other kind of like health promoting activities, right? And I, I, what I would say to them is I don't care, right? Because Yes, it's better to eat a healthy diet. Yes, it's better to be out going out in the sun. And yes, it might be better to make sure that you're thinking about being healthy because if you're not trying to be healthy, you're not doing anything to keep yourself from being unhealthy. These are all modifiable risk factors. And if we look at the last slide, if you had talked to those people who were in the blue, they would have been much happier if someone had given them a talk like this and said, look, I don't know why having low vitamin D is such a big deal, but apparently it's a really big deal. So if I were you, I would go out in the sun, I would eat a good diet, I would take my supplements, and then I would make sure that I had a good vitamin D level. All right, so next slide. So I wanted to talk a little bit about Kawasaki disease. This is um, in the news lately because uh, as we started to see, there were three kids, um, the last I looked at, that got uh, a, a syndrome similar to Kawasaki disease. Um, Kawasaki disease, although it's new to the lay public, it's actually something that pediatricians know about. We do worry about it. It's not very common. I've been in uh, RBK since, since, like I said, since the last century, and I haven't yet to have a patient present to me with Kawasaki disease. I think Dr. Bugu is actually probably um, the one who's seen the most patients with it, right? And, and how many did you say? Did you saw you saw one or two? I think I've seen two, maybe three tops. Yeah, so it, it's a thing that, you know, now he's much faster than me, so he sees a lot more patients, so it, perhaps that's part of the deal, but you could be a regular pediatrician working every day and see thousands of patients every year and still not see it, right? But I think what uh, most parents want to know is what does the Kawasaki disease look like? And this is, uh, in this slide, I put the, the classic way that it presents. The, the one that we're seeing with the COVID-19 is a little bit different in that one of the main symptoms is abdominal pain, right? But the, the key thing that I wanted to let everybody know is that when, you, when, you, when something like this pops out, I think a fear of a parent is always, is this going to be something that I won't know? And and I'm sure George will back me up in that these kids look sick. So it's not something that is going to be obscure. It's going to be something that we're going to know. And, and even though we do a lot of our visits uh, like this, like through telemedicine, 
it's the kind of thing that we're all pretty confident that we'd be able to recognize a super sick kid that needs evaluation and treatment early because it definitely does seem like something that the earlier you treat, the better it works, right? And there are treatments for the Kawasaki. They're, they're you know, not really right now having so many treatments to, to take care of someone who has COVID-19, but there's definitely stuff that we know what to do when someone has Kawasaki disease. So the key is to look for the signs and then usually to get in contact with your friendly neighborhood pediatrician as soon as possible. Next slide. So this I, I put in because this is a thing, right? Um, it, it, it's a, one of the things that we see is that we don't really know what causes Kawasaki, but it, it is a thing that in, in the past, I have another talk which if this is well received, I might give more talks. But I have another talk um, that I've been working on that talks about coronaviruses and the historical kind of experience that we have. And one of the things that we do see is that during past coronavirus outbreaks, there was a known association with Kawasaki disease, right? And so because we're always trying to figure out what causes Kawasaki disease, this is a study where they looked at people who have Kawasaki disease and they see again People with Kawasaki disease, who are usually children, they have low vitamin D. So it seems like um, there are definitely associations with a lot of these kind of things, that people are having poor outcomes when they have low vitamin D. So again, I would say that today is sunny. After this, I want everyone to go outside, go like this, and soak up the sun's rays. Next slide. So vitamin A. So so vitamin A is a very interesting vitamin. One of the ways, one of the diseases that it's most associated with is measles, right? And, um, and Dr. Wagu is actually uh, a survivor from having measles. So he's like always our go-to person when we want to talk about measles because he actually was one of the people who had measles. And uh, one of the things that we're looking for is to make sure everyone gets vaccinated so that way I never get to see a, a person with measles. But measles is very terrible, right, George? It's very terrible when you get it as an adult. I um, worked in the emergency room as an intern in 1996, Jersey City emergency room, measles epidemic. Lo and behold, I got measles. Now the reason, why do you think I got the measles? You're supposed to get your shots. Well, I was of the generation that you could get one, and then they started to transition to two because they realized that one is not enough. Somehow, the schools, I don't know, since when it's changed, you can miss. And if you miss, you can get through um, different job criteria. So I had my blood titers done, and somehow they didn't see it. They didn't look. It was July 4th weekend. My folder got closed. I had no titers. I had no shot, and I worked in the emergency room. I probably was patient zero. I wouldn't be surprised. <laughs> so back to you. Yeah, so the, the vitamin A, one of the things, the reason why it's sort of famous with measles is because they noticed that there are definitely kids in the world where they're low in vitamin A, right? And you can imagine um, if you're low in one of your nutrients, like we're, we were already seeing, then if you get a disease that's strong, like measles, you could be in big trouble. And they actually saw that, that actually treating kids with measles with vitamin A they were actually able to live, right? Um, there is a saying among in Arabic countries, don't count your children to after the measles have passed because it used to be a, a thing where they would get the measles and then they would not make it. Um, vitamin A is, is known as the anti-inflammatory vitamin because it has critical role in maintaining your mucus uh, protective layers. And that's actually how the COVID-19 gets into your body. Um, they have done uh, studies in other coronaviruses, and it does seem like vitamin A has a protective effect. Again, there's no proof with the new novel coronavirus. We usually are not going to get results like that, maybe ever. But it, it is a thing where um, we would want you to be protected, right? Now, vitamin A, um, usually you'll get that from animal products, right? When you can get beta carotene from orange vegetables and... and um, you know, things like, uh, you know, anything that has basically an orangey kind of yellow color. But that's going to be the beta carotene, which some people are missing the gene to be able to convert that into vitamin A. 
So that's how someone could be actually low in a vitamin and not really realize it, right? Because they're a healthy person. Normally, that, that SNP is not going to be a problem for them until they start uh, going on a restrictive diet, um, avoiding kind of meat products and things like that. Like many things, the best sources are usually going to be things like fish and shellfish and liver and meats and things like that. So I would say that if you're at home and you're worried about um, how am I go what's going to happen to me if I get sick, one of the things that I would want to do is I would want to make sure that I was eating good sources of all these kind of vitamins, right? I guess next slide. So zinc is another mineral or is a mineral that actually is um, another kind of thing that's kind of in the news about being helpful to uh, when someone is infected with the COVID. And the reason why is because they've done studies where they actually look at the replicase enzyme. This is a little bit complicated, but when the virus goes inside your body, one of the things it does is it makes extra copies of itself. So they're looking for things that will actually be able to block that. So that way people can't produce other copies themselves. So like when you get the flu, um, sometimes we'll give someone something called Tamiflu. One of the things it does is it makes the flu and, and, and makes it hard for it to produce other copies of itself. The zinc actually goes in the replicase enzyme of the COVID of the SARS-CoV-2 and it protects you from, from producing more copies of itself and then you have a much milder illness, right? If you're low in zinc, that doesn't happen, right? So that's a problem. So I would say that just about every doctor that I know that when they get sick or prophylactically, they're actually trying to make sure that they have adequate levels of zinc. Your best sources of zinc, again, are things like shellfish, seafood, animal meats, the yolk of the eggs, cheeses, beans, and nuts. So usually it's the kind of thing I would want people to kind of be cognizant of this because if they're eating a diet where you know, they eat none of these kinds of things, then it is potentially a thing where they could be low in zinc. And I didn't put this in, the, in this talk today because I felt like I was already going to be talking too long, is that as kids are growing, they're the ones who get low in zinc, right? It is actually one of those reasons why they feel like sometimes teenagers will get depressed or anxious because they'll become low in certainly these minerals because zinc is very important as you're growing to, um, for all the different cellular processes. So it gets eaten up. Um, one of the things that I think people don't realize with zinc is that um, like sometimes uh, uh, I'll see someone who's like low in zinc and they'll be like, I understand Dr. Riley, I eat these foods. If you were eating foods that actually are high in something called phytates, which are usually found in a lot of the cereal products, these, these foods actually will block the zinc that is trying to go into your body. And, and the reasons why are a little bit complicated and beyond the scope of this talk, but it is a thing, for example, like if you're eating a lot of cereal products, even if you're eating meat at the same time, you may not actually get any of the good effect of the meat. Um, so it is a kind of thing. What we try to do is try to get guys to eat a lot of like fruits, vegetables, and meats. That seems to be actually like the best diet to kind of absorb the most nutrients from your food. Can I get my next slide? So vitamin C, so I think, I, I don't have to really belabor the point in terms of vitamin C. It is actually probably uh, the thing that every single hospital in the United States is doing when they admit someone with uh, the COVID illness and they're seeming like they're getting very sick, they're giving them IV levels of vitamin C. And it's definitely a thing where if you give people vitamin C IV when they're sick, it, it's very well known that it decreases the ARDS and they're more likely to be uh, avoiding a vent and to get off the vent uh, sooner. Now, what I think sometimes people don't realize is that um, some of the kids are low in vitamin C and it is a thing like uh, if you ask any teenager that's in college that apparently they all know that there are teenagers in college who get scurvy. Scurvy is like the uh, pirate's disease and it, it is a thing when they're usually avoiding or not really avoiding but they're not eating fresh fruits and vegetables and they're eating a lot of like pizza and other kind of starchy foods, they won't get enough vitamin C and then they will get uh, more prone to different viral illnesses. They have done studies where they took people, usually like soldiers, and they gave them vitamin C and they actually saw that they were able to get less uh, rhinoviral kind of infections. So it does seem that eating a healthy diet with enough vitamin C um, seems to protect you from getting different kind of viral illnesses. 
and and the COVID, like I said, there does seem to be some protective effects. So um, it again usually seems like part of the reason why people get sick is that the increased amount of cereal products um, demand more vitamin C. So you actually have to almost like eat extra vitamin C as the antidote for those other kind of processed kind of foods, right? So yeah, another, so that would be one of my recommendations is not necessarily that I need people to take mega doses of vitamin C. In fact, eating too much vitamin C potentially could be a problem, but eating fresh fruits, um, especially if you get sick, that's the way I want people to go, right? Um, next slide. So the B vitamins, um, they're involved in a lot of the different kind of um, cellular processes in your body. And there's a lot of uh, evidence in terms of how these things are supposed to be helping you when you get sick, right? So I put just a couple of examples on the slide to, for you to read. But basically, again, if you're eating a, a diet that includes a lot of the things that I show in the picture, then you're going to be getting all your B vitamins, right? If you're eating none of these foods, right, and most of your foods are coming in a box, then you, you are going to be low in these kind of vitamins. And the problem is that there's, uh, there's so many of these vitamins, it's impossible for me, even though I'm a joint labs kind of person, to actually know if you're actually low in one of them. So I would just take it out of the equation and I would try to eat as healthy a diet as I can involving most of the foods that you see on this kind of slide. But uh, if you hate avocado, it's not like you have to eat avocado, but certainly if you hate all vegetables, uh, we're gonna have to learn to like to eat some of these kind of foods, right? Can I get the next slide? So this is actually, um, this, is the real, this is the real problem, is that I've, I've talked to some people who work in the ICU and it seems like most of the people who are getting super sick, obesity is part of their problem or they're overweight or they're having some other kind of thing as, as part of the deal. And it's, it's the collision of the two epidemics. It's the epidemic in obesity and the epidemic, the pandemic of COVID-19. And unfortunately, my patients that come to see me for this uh, problem of obesity, you can see now why they are more prone to all these things because you can see from the slide, they're low in a lot of the vitamins, right? And it's usually they're kind of, they're, they're undernourished even though that they're suffering from obesity. And this actually is not something that people kind of, it's a hard thing to understand, right? And even among doctors, it's, it's, a, it's an issue, right? So even when we when we want to set people up, for example, for bariatric surgery, it's a very well-known kind of thing that we have to, to kind of uh, buff them out to make sure that all their vitamin levels are in a normal range because this is what we see is that like, uh, like a, a ton of them are low in their vitamins. And then if we do a, a stress to their body like a surgery, they're, they're more likely to have a poor outcome, right? So it is a thing that um, it's very, very important if you're over the 95th percentile in your BMI, no matter what age you are, to make sure that you're actually cutting out some of the foods that have no nutrition and replacing them with foods that have more nutrition, right? Which again, are, are mainly these kind of things like fish and shellfish and, and animal meats and organ meats and things like that, right? And it, it definitely is the, the kind of thing that we see that um, the guys who really, really do poorly it usually tends to be the older they are, they have obesity, they have other kind of medical problems on top of it. And then the, the nutritional deficiencies, to tell you the truth, a lot of the adult doctors, they barely even order any of the tests that, that they need to do, uh, uh, you know, let alone some of these tests that, um, uh, which are kind of more like you have to be more of a thorough kind of person. All right, I guess last slide. So this is, the reason why I put in this slide is, is to remind me to kind of like ask everybody who actually went on this, this Zoom meeting is that, that it's basically the same thing for almost every kind of medical problem. If you have a healthy lifestyle where you're eating the right kind of foods, you're sleeping enough, which I didn't talk about today, or exercise, going outside, this seems to be all things that you can do that you can kind of gain control of your life and help to protect yourself 
from having a bad outcome from the COVID-19. And to tell you the truth, I, I don't really see, I think, enough information on the news about how people can protect themselves. So I need you guys to talk to your friends and to tell everybody about the things that you're kind of learning about for me today, because this is definitely a thing. If everyone, the reason why we have the lockdown is because we know that there are some people who are unhealthy and when they get the COVID-19, they are going to get super sick. If everyone was healthy, really, we wouldn't have had to do the lockdown. We would have actually been able to live our lives. We wouldn't have had all this kind of like disruption and, and, and everything that we want to do. It's to protect the vulnerable people, right? But if we had less vulnerable people, we would have less tragedy. All right, I think that's it. So thank you. Thank you, everybody who went on the call. Thank you, Dr. Rogu, for setting this up. He's, he's actually giving up time on his day off, which uh, I appreciate it a lot. Okay, Dr. Riley, there are a couple of questions in the chat. Maybe you could entertain them. Okay. Um, let me go to the first one. Uh, it says, can a 12-week-old take vitamin D supplements or is the one that's in the milk should be enough in the breast milk? So it is a good question, right? And it is the kind of thing, if you're solely breastfeeding, we give actually already all those babies vitamin D, right? And usually the moms, they're usually taking their prenatal vitamins, which also have vitamin D, right? But it is the kind of thing that obviously it depends on if the mom has low vitamin D, which um, it is a thing that, again, this is not part of this talk, but maybe in future talks, if there's an interest, um, there are a lot of associations with moms having more vitamin D and then the health of their children. So it is one of the reasons why all the formulas are supplemented with vitamin D. So if you're taking formula, you shouldn't actually need extra vitamin D for an infant. And for breastfeeding moms, we, we actually usually give them vitamin D. There's another one over here that says, my son has vitamin D deficiency. Is there something extra other than vitamin D that I can do for him? I guess so that, that was the slide with the fish where we showed that there are actually many things that you could actually do. So on days like today where it's sunny outside, it's the kind of thing that um, you can actually go out in the sun. So normally how much vitamin D you would need um, depends a lot on your genetics and, and on your diet and things like that. So for example, like you can have dietary sources of vitamin D. So if you're eating healthy animals, for example, like animals that were wild caught fish or or grass-fed beef, they tend to actually have more vitamin D when you eat them, and those get absorbed in your body, so you actually get more vitamin D. This is part of the reason why they charge you an arm and a leg to get grass-fed beef, because it is actually healthier for you, and the more healthier animals you eat, the, the more other kind of health benefits you get. But yeah, I would say going outside, you know, if you're in the summertime and you're wearing shorts, and you're out in the sun for about 15 minutes, you actually get like 10,000 IUs of vitamin D. So that is like a mega dose of vitamin D. And the more that you do that, the better. But a lot of these guys, they're inside kind of people, playing video games, things like that. It's not so good for them. God designed us to go outside. I would say that that would be the thing. And then trying to stay away from the processed food, because like I said, the processed food seems to eat the vitamin D. So there are definitely people, like my brother works outside. He had low of the vitamin D and he was like, Jimbo, I don't understand. How could I have low vitamin D? I work outside. But he also drinks two cans of Coke a day. He, he goes to the deli, eats a lot of bread. It's a, it's a problem. There's a question here on what is an appropriate dose for a 13-year-old? Is it the 5,000 of the vitamin D or the 1,000? So like get blood any, level first. Yeah, so George is 100% right, right? He's a smart guy. So it is a thing. Like normally... I don't know exactly. So when people ask me these kind of questions, uh, I usually tell them about one of my kids who her vitamin D was 17. Everyone in my wife's family seems to have low vitamin D and they have early onset osteoporosis. So this was not really a surprise. And uh, so I gave her enough vitamin D to, to get her into a normal level. And then uh, we rechecked it and it was not a normal level. So I had to double it. And then after I doubled it, it still was actually very low. So I had to triple it. And then she got into a normal vitamin D level. And that kid already eats a healthy diet because I'm a monster. 
I make sure that they, everybody eats healthy food. I already yelled at someone today because they were eating a donut in, in front of me. So it is, like a, it is like a thing, right, where to have normal vitamin D, um, you have to recheck. The AP right now, I think, recommends for everyone to have 600 vitamin D. That's why when you have your multivitamin, it's supplemented with 600 of vitamin D. But it depends what we see on your bloods, right? So normally around nine or 10, we send people for bloods to look at their vitamin D. So it depends a lot on that. So if somebody wanted to have an individual consult, one of the docs can look at your labs and things like that, and we would get an idea. But again, if you went outside, if you ate a lot of fish, if you gave up the processed food, it almost is like moot because it is the kind of thing most people that'll actually be good for them unless you have like a genetic issue. All right. There's two questions on this. What about sunscreen and vitamin D absorption? Good or bad? So sunscreen blocks out UVB. UVB is the part of the sun's rays that actually allows our bodies to produce vitamin D. So this is one of the things that we, we kind of think is perhaps helping to produce the um, low vitamin D epidemic, right? Because we definitely have all gotten the message that we don't want to get sunburned. So we're using sunblock when we go outside, but this is actually also pre pre preventing us from producing vitamin D. Now, we don't want people to get skin cancer, certainly, and, and the most intense sun rays are usually between 10 and two. So what, what we would say is that, yeah, so like if you're out during the early part of the day or the later part of the day, and you um, could do a little bit of sun exposure without the, without the harmful UVA, um, then that actually perhaps might be a little bit better, right? But the UVA is the more intense sun, uh, and, and actually a lot of the sunscreens don't even protect against UVA. That's another talk, right? Where usually we'd want to ideally have a sunscreen which helps block both of them, but most of them actually work better for UVB, which is perhaps even the more helpful one. Um, and then there's something about diet. Is chicken okay or do they have to just eat red meat? No, it's actually any kind of, so it, can, it doesn't have to be cow, it could be pork, or it could be chicken. But if you eat a, this is the weird thing about some of the animal kind of meats is that if you eat a chicken and, and they were inside all day, then they're more likely to have low vitamin D, right? But if you eat what I call a happy chicken, um, where they were outside pecking at bugs, things like that, then they are more likely to have a normal vitamin D. And you can even see this when you go to buy uh, eggs, for example, that you could see that the eggs that were outside, they were pasture raised. That's, that's the code word, because cage free means they were in a cage. And, uh, and, and it is the kind of thing that usually um, it has to say pasteurized for them to have the most uh, vitamin D. And those eggs actually, I've had them side by side and those eggs look a lot more orange. And that's usually a sign that they had a lot more vitamins. Um, I think that's it. Unless somebody else has a question, any last thoughts? Yeah, so I mean, I guess that's the, the main message that I wanted to say to people was to, to try to talk to your friends, right? Because this is like, you know, we're all in this together, right? And unfortunately, it doesn't help if only one person has this information. This is, this is why I asked Dr. Wagu to kind of to give me some time um, because we all need to know, right? And and especially the, the slides, there are slides from many different countries which show the survival rate of people who have low vitamin D, it's scary. It really is scary. So uh, if, you know, vitamin D is such a benign intervention, I really, I just want everybody to know. Okay. Uh, thank you very much. Uh, I guess we'll sign off right now. And if um, this is something that our patients would like, we'll keep developing topics and send it out to everybody. Whoever wants to join, will join. Whoever wants to uh, view it later, We'll find a place on our social media or our website to store these things for the future. So Mari, I'm just curious about if there's a zinc um, a supplement that you recommend or a vitamin D supplement that you do recommend for the kids? Yeah, so normally we would give you vitamins. That would be a prescription. The zinc is one of these things in particular where we kind of have to look 
because it's the kind of thing that, um, like I like I said earlier, it, like it's much it's much better if you get these kind of things naturally because you're not going to overdose by eating healthy foods. But if you were to quickly Google and see what would happen if you ate too much zinc in a supplement, um, it is actually a little bit problematic, right? And unfortunately, we don't have good resources for a lot of supplements in terms of like the, this is the best one because the government actually has zero interest in regulating supplements, right? So there are like very good studies where guys went into uh, like supplement stores, picked out something like Hootia, for example, and, and only 15% of the supplements that actually say they have Hootia actually have Hootia in it, right? So most of the time you're just buying, you're paying a lot of money for like grasses and things like that because this is a lot of uh, scammy kind of things going on, right? And uh, zinc, it depends on your formulation and things like that. It's, it's, a, it's a little bit of a complicated kind of thing. So um, um, usually we'd have to like look at like particularly the kid and see if there was anything else. But again, most kids, like if I'm worried that they have low zinc, I would just send them to get a zinc level. I do that for a lot of medical problems. And if they do, then I give them a specific prescription. Okay. So I guess we could end it here, Dr. Riley. All righty. All right. Thank you, everybody, for joining us. Until the next one. All right. Tell your friends and view this on the social media. All right. Ready? See you later. Bye-bye. Okay, bye. Can't get rid of Lisa. There we go. She has the power. Yeah, I got her. All right, so that worked out well. Yeah, I think it wasn't. It was a little bit longer than I was trying to go for, but. Uh, but uh, I just had so many things. Right? How was she still on the phone? I got rid of her. What? How was Lisa still online? I got rid of her. I think that was Simon. Simon. Oh. Like talks to our. All right. So I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to let it process now, and then I'll put it up somewhere. Now, right. when you put it on, on Facebook, does, that, does it say, like, how many people looked at it, kind of? Now, I'm going to put it to YouTube, and then they'll go to YouTube, and that's what it'll say. Oh, okay. All right. So we'll get it done. And uh, I got Kristen working on these other two newsletters today. Oh, yeah. She was supposed to come today. Okay. Yeah, she's going to work. She has two. She has to work on one, the 10th follow-up one. and. Um, I did one yesterday with Kathy and Anne on um, the curbside check-in. Oh, did you get the videos? I tried to send it to you last night. It looked like it should have worked. That one worked. I don't know what she did, but that one was fine. So I got I uploaded those for Kristen also. She'll work on those two. And then the two that you and Nick got to do, and then I think we'll be good. I wonder right. if I could just videotape myself and then just send it to you. Right? So, okay. Yeah, you can on the phone. Yeah, I'll try to do it. and then you just, I'll... just do it on the phone. Or have somebody do it for you. One minute, two minutes, and just upload it to Google Drive and I'll put it into her folder. All right. Even if you put it to your Google Drive, which might be easier, I could take it from there. Actually, if you would send it to adoptiondoctors.com, that's a little bit easier. Because that's where that's where Kristen is connected to, not the not the other one. All, All right. right. All right. Good job. Keep it up. All right. See you. Bye.